We're going to talk a little bit perhaps about some risk or some risk related stuff here. We're, we're talking about uncertain times, geopolitics, trade and rate cycles in, well it says 2017. I think we should probably be talking about 2018. Yes, we are on that uh, slide. Let me introduce the panelists very quickly. From left to right as you see it, uh, Bas Bakker is a senior resident Senior Resident Representative, the Regional Office of Central, Eastern and Southeastern Europe at the IMF. He's based in, in Warsaw. To my left, uh, Vincent Chignot is the Head of Research at Generali Investments Europe, uh, based in Paris. Uh, and at last, we have a woman on a panel on the, on the Euromoney stage this morning. Thank goodness for that. Astrid Frey Kaufmann is Deputy Head of Economic Research and Consulting in Macroeconomics and a Director of the Swiss Re Institute based inevitably in Zurich. Now, geopolitics is by definition a global thing. Um, a North Korea event. North Korea is very, very far away, but it could affect us here. Um, but what do we care about most in this region? I'm just going to ask each of the panelists in a minute or less just to, to tell us which bit of geopolitics particularly grabs their attention. Uh, I offered them a few options. Is it Russia? Is it a changing dynamic between France and Germany in the EU? Uh, is it diminishing Atlanticism in the US? Is it Middle East Africa instability driving migrations of people? Is it something else? You pick whatever you like. Astrid, why don't you lead off? Um, I think there's lots of geopolitical uh, moves that are going on that are very interesting. However, not all of them are having a global impact. One that I think is having a profound global impact is the tendency of the US administration under, the, um, under Trump to withdraw as the world's superpower number one. Um, that raises interesting questions if that were to happen, which is not guaranteed at all at all. One of them is the end state, so who will take over from the US as the world's superpower number one, and arguably, arguably there's only one nation that over time will be willing and able to step into that role, which is China. Um, but more interestingly, and maybe more imminently and more worryingly at the same time, is this transition period. Uh, this, this, this period of limbo where the US is not quite willing to play that role as the world's guardian of security and China is not quite willing and able yet to step into that place. That's a dangerous place to be in, especially with uh, countries like North Korea playing with fire. Okay, in interesting. Vincent. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I would mention, I think, uh, the tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is uh, something that matters globally, and I see that as the uh, number one uh, geopolitical concern. It feeds into CEE also in two ways. Uh, one is migration. Uh, we know that migration is a particular point of tension between some CEE countries and the EU. But also, the developments in uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia uh, somehow are a barometer of uh, the position of Russia uh, in the uh, war scene. And obviously, uh, the actions of Russia will matter very much for CE. Okay, Bas, what's your pick? Before I start about what worries me, let's first take a step back. Last year, in this conference, we were also worried about a lot of things, but things have been much better than we feared. Last year, consensus forecast for the Eurozone was 1.5% growth in 2017 and 18. Now we think it's about two and a quarter. So things are better. The world economy is doing the best since 2011, and 2018 is even better. That being said, what are some of the things that could be risked. Well, one is an oil price shock. In 2000, between 2014 and 2016, oil prices crashed from 115 to 35, which led to very low inflation. Now they are back at 70. The world no longer has an output cap, so a shock to oil prices could have an inflationary impact. The second is what is happening with the EU. The EU has been incredibly useful for Eastern Europe. EU integration of Eastern Europe is a big untold success story. 
We hope this will continue and is particularly important for the Western Balkans, who are not yet member, but the perspective for that really helps the region. Okay, thank you. Right, so we've got several different things to chew on there, and thank you all for, for choosing different things. I'd, I'd, I'd just spend another minute with each of you and ask you to, to comment on some of the things that your colleagues have said. Vincent, Astrid mentions um, uh, the decline of, of US, the, the US as a, as a global superpower, uh, and obviously implications there for security, clearly also implications for, for the oil price that you've just mentioned. Um, but is it... Well, I'd like to ask if you share that view, but I'd like to put, you, put to you a contrasting view for a moment. Um, we're used to thinking of China, second largest economy in the world, of course, as a great superpower, uh, but you know, China has one former Ukrainian aircraft carrier, and they can take, the planes can take off, but they can't yet land. I know they're building some more, and they've got some islands, but they're not very mobile as aircraft carriers. The US has got 13 carrier battle groups uh, and can interdict a fishing boat on any of the seas of the world. Is what Astrid describes a likely outcome, in your view, given that massive disparity in power? I, I agree. I think we, we are moving towards a more multipolar uh, world, uh, dominated not just by the US, but of course China, if we think medium term, long term, uh, clearly will be another superpower. Uh, uh, in the near term, I would clearly highlight uh, Russia as another key play, player. I think it's, it's, sorry, but do you agree at the, 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 uh, the start with Astrid's thesis that the US, is, the, the US role is diminishing or likely to diminish? Absolutely, and in particular it's hard to, to deny that uh, you know, Russia somehow has uh, stopped uh, or, or suddenly disrupted the effort of NATO or EU to expand uh, toward the, uh, the East. Uh, also, Russia has managed to stop uh, the removal of Bashar al-Assad uh, in Syria. I think those uh, clearly are, are very important developments that indeed uh, is showing that uh, uh, the US is no longer right now uh, uh, that, that number one dominate, I mean it is the number one, but not the prominent dominant player in the geopolitics. Uh, there is Russia clearly who has an influence. Russia's economy is in more than 10 times smaller than the US. So that economic disparity that you're talking about clearly uh, remains true. The US is a superpower. But Russia is militarily a great deal more powerful than China. Yeah, but China will be rising and, and developing that, uh, that part. Okay, Astrid, um, I'm sure you don't want to get into counting aircraft carriers and things like that, but respond to, to I, I think I would want to put the point that, yes, I recognize the validity in what you say, but China, despite its economic power, um, and incidentally, we've just seen this morning in the FT, I don't know if everybody saw this, quite a nice piece of news, um, saying that China's economic recovery or new growth phase um, was much more impressive than it appeared because they'd been lying about their economic statistics previously when growth was slowing down faster than they had admitted. This is now official news, so that was an interesting little sidebar to what you're saying. Um, but notwithstanding that, will you accept some sort of challenge to your thesis that the US is just so much more powerful than China and is likely to remain so that that interregnum isn't going to happen? Do you yeah, want to come back and argue by, again? By no means do I want to imply that um, China is taking over immediately. Indeed, I'm, I'm not certain that it will happen any time over the next decade. Um, but I think what, what is hard to deny is that under the Trump administration, there's an element of uncertainty that has been instilled. So um, it, it's not even the fact whether or not the US will actually withdraw from that role that matters in the end. It's the uncertainty around that, which, which is already quite, quite, a, you know, quite a change. Okay, what we, I can't remember if it was Bas or you, did, who, which of you mentioned Iran and Saudi Arabia? Benson mentioned. Let's, let's just go back to that point, and, and I mentioned that in my opening remarks. Um, this seems to me a, a fairly major geopolitical story. US, Saudi, and Israel on one side of a sort of putated, uh, um, uh, I don't want to call it a conflict, but um, standoff uh, pivoting on the Middle East with Russia, Iran, and Turkey, and, and Syria indeed, as you just mentioned, on the other side. 
Um, you have some knowledge and expertise of, of Saudi Arabia, and obviously you look at it from an economic point of view. Um, do you see that as a developing story, or is it just a, a mirage put about by people who like to play these sort of geopolitical puzzle games? I think there's clearly important things happening in Saudi Arabia, and I wouldn't call myself an expert, but um, here in Europe, we often see the main enemy in that region as the Islamic State and the terrorism emerging from, that kind, from those kind of thoughts. Um, in the region, I think the main enemy or adversary has always been Iran, and that continues to be the case, and that is the case for diverse countries like Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Israel, and others. Uh, so I think it's, it's this um, common adversary that creates these kind of um, unlikely alliances so there, between Saudi and Israel, for example. Perhaps counterintuitively align somewhat with Mr. Trump, who seems to have overturned Mr. Obama's <laughs> rather relaxed oh. attitude towards Iran. I think Trump is clearly playing along that game, so he's a, he's a willing or at least not opposing ally in the region's quest to um, rein in the power of Iran. Okay, we, 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 we'll come back to, to, to the Europe question, which you also raised in a moment, and the, the potential for there being some uh, geopolitical story there. But Bas, you come in, if you would, on, on what we have just been discussing. These two kind of apparent grand alliances, strange bedfellows in some cases, uh, but clearly on one side is Russia and on the other side is the US, um, and the sort of proxy uh, between Saudi and, and, and Iran that, that Astrid just talked about. How do you see that situation developing? Um, well, let me stay away from politics, but let me come back to the worries there is a worry that the U.S. will withdraw from the world, that trade will be at risk. But what we've seen in the last year, in practice, is a bit the opposite. Trade is accelerating, investment is accelerating, growth is accelerating. So all these risks are definitely there, but we should not only focus on the risks, but also what is happening in practice, and that is much better than what we I worried agree. about. There was, there, was some, there was some fat bald man who gave some opening remarks who said that this year, last year, finally, trade, growth in trade, uh, was greater than growth in, in aggregate GDP, which is as it should be. But for yes. a couple of years, the world lived in a very anomalous situation, which is really quite worrying, where trade was not increasing, even at the same pace as rather weak global economic growth. Yes. We've turned that corner. This is good. This is good. Yes. Okay, right. Let's talk about another good thing, which is the European Union, and what is happening as we see it today in some... There, I mean, there isn't a... We can't pretend this isn't happening. Um, there is a possibility that, that Poland uh, might come under the, the sanction of Article 7 of the European Union, European Commission. Um, there is talk also that Hungary might find itself in, in, in a similar position. Um, there is undeniably some kind of conflict emerging, and, or, or maybe not conflict, but divergent points of view. And at the same time, of course, in, in the traditional axis of power in, in the European Union, Western Europe, between Germany and France, both countries, let, let's assume for the moment that, uh, that Mrs. Merkel um, gets in bed with the, with, with the uh, SPD, uh, and that all, you know, is a nice new rainbow coalition. France and Germany are looking pretty strong together with a new sense of political purpose, particularly on the French side, I would say. Would you agree? You are French. Yeah, I, I would agree. agree. I would agree. You might be Belgian, but I'm you're French. French. I'm French. Good. Well done. Um, w what is happening there? I think the conflict we see between Western Europe and some countries in Eastern Europe is in some ways similar to what we see in the United States in the conflict between Democrats and Republicans. The disagreements, they are about far more than just economics. They are about cultural issues, about how one sees the world, about immigration, 
political correctness, a lot of things. And that makes the issues much harder to solve than if it was just economics. There is also the power balance in the EU is now very different than it was in the early 90s when uh, the EU, EU countries in Eastern Europe were all still very small and just uh, entering uh, capitalism. Now they have grown 20 years quite strongly, they are quite large and they are much more self-confident and they are no longer in a situation where they want to be told what to do. So you have a more self-confident Eastern Europe. Uh, you have a difference in cultural outlook and that creates conflicts that are not easy to resolve. But I think there is increasingly a willingness on both sides to address the issue. Poland uh, just had a new government uh, with several new people in it. Uh, who are probably much better viewed in Western Europe and probably make it easier uh, to resolve conflicts in the future. In, in, your, in your little pairing there, clearly Eastern Europe is taking the role of the US Republicans and Western Europe the role of the US Democrats. If you're, if you're, you're sort of drawing up your, your two sides of the sheet, your two columns. That's correct. Um, the Republicans won, you know. And? But I, don't, I just mention it. Um, right, let's turn to a Frenchman. Because Monsieur Macron does seem to me a, a fantastically interesting personality and a new force on the global political stage. And he clearly wants to make, and, and rightly so, wants France to stand up as, as a great world power, economically, strategically, and in every other way. And that's absolutely as it should be. It is, after all, the oldest country in the world. Maybe Iceland. <laughs> anyway. Um, how do you see this developing? Do, do you agree with Bass's analysis? Oh, there's no doubt that uh, immigration is a major uh, area of tension uh, between you know, some of the large uh, sea countries. Uh, we talk about uh, Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, um, and the EU. Um, eventually, I believe that the economic interest will prevail. Um, I don't think it's in anybody's interest uh, to get that uh, immigration issue uh, disrupt the uh, relation to, uh, to badly. So, you know, we are watching that. We're not very worried. And there, there is potentially some positive development. You know, let's see whether that grand coalition in Germany uh, makes a comeback. But if you look at the uh, platform, uh, that, you know, on which you have a, a, a draft uh, agreement. There are some uh, efforts towards EU integration. Uh, Mr. Macron also is pu pushing towards this. Of course, there are different shades of grey of gray in, the, in the projects, but we could see some positive development on that, on that front. And immigration will be a point of tension, but I don't think this is going to jeopardize the, the whole effort. And of course, to play devil's advocate, one might point out that the difference, the, the, the divergent attitudes towards immigration that you've just described reflect on the one hand, governments in the East listening to their electorates, yeah. and on the other hand, governments in the West refusing to listen to their electorates. Is there some validity in that point? I don't know if they, they, they refuse to, uh, to, to, to listen. You know, wh wh one point I would underline is that we are right now in very good uh, economic times. The economy is doing very, very well. Um, and usually that's not uh, the moment when, when, when you see populists, uh, you know, make a major breakthrough and, and come to the power. So immigration clearly uh, support uh, a bit of a populist wave, but eventually the economic strength um, stands in the way. Um, okay, Astrid, your, your comment on what they've just said. Do you, do you uh, think that, like that prosperity just means the electorate will suck up stuff they don't like? <laughs> let, let me make one point first about Mr. Macron. Um, I have to confess that as a, as a Swiss, I'm a bit skeptical about this ever closer union uh, direction that some in the EU want to go. So in my view, it's Mr. Macron's benefits will be more visible 
when it comes to the French economy rather than the EU economy. Fair enough. I mean, he was elected by the people of France, so benefiting France more would be kind of goes and, from the and, job and description. And that would be the hope. And then another remark on, on divergence between East and West. I think it's not so much about divergence at this point in time. There's always been differences in cultures between some of the Western and, and the Eastern countries. But historically, since the EU enlargement um, towards the East, the integration has always been perceived as going from East to West. The West didn't move. Now, due to various factors, such as good economic performance, uh, in, in Eastern Europe, uh, there has been a, a rise in confidence uh, in Eastern Europe. But also, within the Western countries, the consensus around important issues such as migration has become more fragile. So that integration dynamic is now, is now changing, and the West seems to be surprised. Um, just to borrow a quote from the Swiss novelist Max Frisch, uh, in 2004, the EU, the Western countries, they thought that they would integrate new markets. Now there's a realization that, in fact, people joined. So it's that cultural shift that I think is and very interesting. And people bring their historical baggage exactly. and their cultural baggage. Exactly. I mean, exactly. And, but, but, but also, another in important point, I think, is to, to recognize that in the West, it's not just Democrats, and that in the East, it's not just Republicans. So there's a, a diversity among or within those countries as well that I think is, is maybe worth highlighting. Oh, no doubt, and one could sort of adumbrate a whole other load of pairs, which side is romantic and which is classical, which, which side is uh, masculine, which is feminine, which is Bordeaux and which is Burgundy. But this is a great parlor game which we can all play later. But you've all located this divergence, whatever we're going to call it, that's the word we seem to have settled on, um, in, in, in the point of immigration and, and migration, migration to peoples. There must be more to it than that, isn't there? Because that is obviously a, a, a political thing which could be, could be stopped or could be started, in, on, depending on your point of view. It's, it, it's not a sort of inevitable, inbuilt thing. Are, are there more fundamental reasons for a divergence, Baz? I think immigration is a particularly important issue and because it reflects several issues. It, it reflects what kind of society do you want? Do you want to keep your own cultural roots or do you want to have a very open society? Um, another, another one is countries do not want to be told what to do. And in the case of immigration, this was in all the countries in Eastern Europe uh, that are now in conflict, they were against it, yet they were overruled. If you are overruled on an issue that you find of particular importance, you're very likely to put your foot in the sand. So this is a, since this reflects so much different worldviews, it's, it's not easy to just have a compromise, P people get very, get, very, get very strong views, and this is what makes it so hard. Okay, we, obviously we, we all know that the, the panel has, has, has overrun. We've got five more minutes. Okay, um, we could carry on this conversation for, for all day long. It's, it's absolutely fascinating, I hope. Well, for you to tell us it's fascinating, I agree. Um, let's just move on for the last five minutes um, to this question of the, the rates environment. It is, <clears throat> we, we've, we've been thinking now for a number of years that QE was sort of on the way and on the way out. In fact, in 2017, 2017 was actually peak QE. The numbers, does anybody disagree with those numbers? Um, and yet there is now really an expectation that by the end of 2018, although the stock may still be very high, the flow will have diminished to zero. Implications of that, there must be profound implications of that for markets, but they're certainly not being priced in in any way I can determine at the moment. Vincent, what do you think? 
Or indeed, the key question is whether uh, the stock dominates or the flow dominates. The ECB will tell you, okay, we're going to reduce the purchases, but our balance sheet for now is still growing, and the stock suddenly remains very high, and therefore the impact will remain. Um, I think the example... The positive that impact. The positive impact will remain. Uh, and in particular, they rely on the Fed experience. I think the Fed experience was very different uh, when the Fed uh, starting to, started to move back, uh, all the central banks were actually uh, easing policies. So the case is very different. I think the flow matters. Um, eventually, the richest asset class is a fixed income one. Um, and we are starting to see this year an adjustment. Uh, the question is whether it will be orderly or not. As long as inflation is under control, uh, we can have an orderly uh, uh, correction, but the fixed income asset class definitely is uh, uh, very exposed to that, and it is the uh, richest asset class. The question is, is that going to impact other asset classes, equities, for example, or risk assets more generally? Um, as long as rates of volatility stay low, um, I think those asset class can withstand that progressive withdrawal from, uh, from central banks. So relatively benign analysis. Astrid, where, where do you place the emphasis? Do you agree that it, it depends so much if you're talking about flow or stock? And what are the implications for this region? Yeah. I, I think the, um, the exit of very, out of very expansionary central bank monetary policy clearly creates the potential for disruption. So there's lots of talks about policy error potentially. However, I do believe that central banks will go out of the way to make sure that this process will happen in a smooth way. Rather than technically speaking, um, you know, of policy errors, I think it's the inflation risk that really matters. Inflation has been very benign for a very long time and we don't see a big risk of inflation spiking up. However, Especially this year, I, I, I see the risk that inflation might surprise to the upside, and that could lead to some reaction in government bond markets, which Vincent says are, are very richly um, valued. I think, you know, fundamentally, interest rates going up is a good thing for the world economy, for this region in particular, um, as long as it doesn't happen in a disruptive way or in a very quick way. Indeed, if interest rates did not go up, that would be positively bad for this region? Yes. Since in the last few years, unemployment in the EU member state is coming down very rapidly. One, one and a half points a year. You can have a debate whether the current level of unemployment is too low, but if the trend continues with one, one and a half percent unemployment a year, in a few years from now, there is definitely a problem. You've already seen in a number of countries in the past year that wages have accelerated, and this will only spread. The problem is labor productivity in the EU new member state is growing by about 2% a year. The working age population is declining by 1%. So you can only grow faster than about 1% to 2% if either the unemployment rate falls sharply, which cannot continue, or labor force participation rises sharply, and there are also limits. So going forward, higher interest rates in advanced country will make it easier for higher interest rate in Eastern Europe, and going forward that will be helpful, not hurtful. Very good. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry we do have to draw to a close. I had a fascinating question. They were all burning to answer about post-Putin Russia. Um, we'll have to save that for private conversations. Uh, but Astrid, Baz, Vincent, thank you very thank you. much for answering these questions. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention. We're now moving on to the next panel. Thank you very much.